Hey guys, Rollout here, and welcome back to Builder's Block. Last week I made Therapist's eyes pink and asked for your opinion, and honestly the consensus is so mixed, I'm not sure if it helped me any. Some people absolutely love it, some people hate it, and a lot of people suggested I make the eyes solid red, which, trust me, I would if I could. Those Baraki eyepieces do not come in solid red. Pink is the closest thing, and so that's what I went with. I might just keep the eyes pink until the day they finally make the parts in the color that I actually want, however long that might be. Hopefully before the heat death of the universe, which, considering how hot it's been, might actually be sooner than later. Anyway, if you want to support weekly content and help me out with Bricklink orders, consider supporting Builder's Block on Patreon. Also, don't forget that there is a public Discord server, so feel free to join. Links to all of that in the description. And now, on with the show. So if you recall, I recorded last week's episode in the middle of a heat wave. It got up to 106 on that day. And then the funniest thing happened. On the next day, it was 112. So forgive the fact that I did not want to spend any amount of time building in my office, and I took the opportunity to showcase one of Starscreamer's recent creations instead. This is another one of his own synchro frames that he built a few days prior. He built another one a while back called Midnight Crusade, but this one is sort of a jet-themed dragon-like character called Y-Burner. Now, I said before I don't really have a place for these in the story I eventually want to tell, but after some thought, there is a way that these could technically be canon. Because at the end of the day, beyond any sort of official narrative, Synchro Frame really is just an excuse to build some cool and imaginative little robot designs with a lot of creative freedom. And so, of course, I welcome anyone building their own Synchro Frames as well. The thing is, is that the lens of the plot surrounding my main characters is actually pretty narrow. It doesn't globe trot or lead to the world championships like so many tournament animes reach towards. The competition aspect only goes up to like a regional level, and it spends much more time exploring underground or street level fights. And that opens up a whole lot of room for synchro frames that exist in other parts of the world. Regional, national, and world level pilots that have absolutely nothing to do with Alpha and Beta. So Starscreamer's designs could just exist as fighters from the world stage that you might see in a commercial or a poster for the bigger tournaments, but they wouldn't actually interact with the main story. And the same goes for all fan-made synchro frames too, so again, feel free to imagine your own in the same way. With that said, let's take a closer look at Wyburner. The name is a combination of Wyvern, Burn, and Vernier. It has a cockpit on the chest, it has big wing arms, kind of like Transformers Prime sound wave, it's got landing gear feet, and an overall dragon theme. It's also got the fins on the back, and whether it was intentional or not, I think it has very clear Metal Gear inspirations. Personally, it also reminds me of Chrono Jet Dragon from Card Fight Vanguard, because it's a jet-themed dragon with wheel feet. I had a lot of input in the design of this. Uh, I've said this before, pretty much anything either I or Starscreamer builds is in some way collaborative. We you know, give each other advice as we build. And so one thing I was concerned about is the fact that it doesn't have optics of any kind on its head, because that's supposed to be something that's very unique for beta in particular. Most synchro frames have optics, and it's supposed to be very strange and alien that beta specifically does not have optics of any kind. So I suggested that maybe the pilot that syncs up with this frame actually sees through the cockpit on his chest, like 
the cockpit in orange here are the actual optics, and the head is instead a weapon that spits fire instead of being what the pilot actually sees out of. I think that's an interesting idea. I did tease him uh, that both of his synchro frames so far just have a gray and black color scheme. So uh, maybe the next one will be a little bit more colorful, but it is based on a fighter jet. They're typically gray, so it makes sense for him to be these colors. Here he is from the back. He's got some more thrusters. You can see there's additional landing gear on the tail because he needs his tail to stand upright with these wheel feet here. And here he is jetting around. I like to imagine that the wings just provide downforce. He doesn't actually have a flight ability of any kind, uh, but I think it's still pretty cool regardless. He jets around, he spits fire. It's very, very awesome. Here he is facing off against Midnight Crusade. You can see I added a flame effect part there. And one thing about both of these synchro frames is that they're very large, especially compared to all of my other characters. Um, and that's one of the reasons I was hesitant to put them in the story at all, because I, I couldn't really make sense of that at the time. But it would make sense, especially if these were world-class fighters. They've got more funding. They've got more sponsors that there would be a much more heavyweight class that they are a part of, whereas the smaller circuits are much lighter weight, much smaller robots. The one synchro frame that I have built that is a world-class fighter is Garudan, and he is much larger than my other synchro frames. He's at least a head taller, so that completely checks out with the world building I've already established. On the next day, I continued working on my bedroom furniture project. I reworked the stuff on top of this bookshelf on the left here, just that it fit in the room a little bit better. Uh, and then I built a clothes hamper with a printed sock piece on top, just to kind of get that across, and a, a trash can over here on the right, which has some pretty cool techniques in there with how I got the the one by one plates uh, sort of lined up inside, so that there's you know multicolored trash in the bag. But that's all I built for furniture. On this day, most of my time was spent building the actual floor and wall structure of the room. And this is where I realized once again that I hate building with bricks. <laughs> Obviously, I build very small and intricate robots and transformers and things usually, but when it comes to actually building houses and rooms and structures out of just typical Lego bricks, I find it so monotonous and frustrating, and this took all of my willpower and attention span to accomplish. <laughs> so it's got a wall uh, with a window on one side, and then it has two entrances on uh, either of these other walls. And then on the far wall opposite of the window, it has this display with some swords propped up. It's actually a framed piece of cork board that has some of the Bionicle roleplay swords uh, pinned up onto it. So there's Tahu's sword in the middle and Tahu Nuva's swords on either side. Uh, that's been in my room for the longest time, so I definitely wanted to build that into this wall. Here is the other side of the structure, so you can see how I achieved that with some snot techniques. It's got some crimes towards the bottom here with some exposed studs, but those are hidden by the bookshelf directly in front of it, which is awfully convenient. You can see that the walls of the room are very haphazardly thrown together. There's not a whole lot of logical and efficient structure. I just grabbed what I could to build the shape that I needed to build and, and called it a day. At the end of this day, I was spent. I was so over this creation. Uh, and in order to continue, in order to add posters to the wall, I would need to completely rebuild the walls. I'd need to tear them apart and rebuild them so I could add studs to the surface in order for that to happen. And I just did not want to do that on this night. So 
I, I gave it a rest and continued on the next day. So first, I rebuilt the clothes hamper because I felt like the printed sock, uh, while it, it got the idea across that it was a clothes hamper, it just kind of didn't fit with the style of the rest of the room. So I wanted to build like a brick built pile of multicolored clothing. And then I also built this office chair here, which uses kind of a, a typical design I've seen on the internet with a little bit of my own flair thrown in. So here is the completed room for the most part i would make some changes later on but but this is the basic idea completed i did regrettably <laughs> or begrudgingly rather uh, rebuild the walls to make them a lot more efficient make them make a lot more sense and so that i could add posters to the walls i added a coat hanger in the back where i obviously keep my coats, but also my keys. Uh, and you can see the, the new laundry hamper and desk chair there. I also obviously knocked out one of the walls uh, with the window on it, frankly, because I did not want to mess with uh, creating the curtains that go over that window. Um, and also there's a bunch of posters on that wall too. And it saves me a lot of trouble just knocking that wall out of the way. So you can see into the room a whole lot better. It just was a decision that made a whole lot of sense. Uh, something I didn't mention before actually is the way the bed connects to the floor. In this picture in particular, you can see uh, a bit of tan underneath it. That's actually because I have a, a cardboard box under my bed uh, where I keep snacks, chips, and candy and things. And so that's a, a convenient way to both attach the bed to the floor and also represent a feature of the room. Uh, so here is kind of an internal shot. Uh, and, and I'm surprised actually how much this feels like the real room once you get inside it like this. Um, I'm quite proud and impressed of that fact. And it, it kind of makes me uh, glad to have this on display in my actual room because it, it's got like a weird book nook sort of vibe. You know, you step into the room, you look at this Lego creation, you realize that it's the room that you're in. It's, it's kind of very surreal. Here it is from the other side. I think it looks especially great from this angle because you can see so many of the other features. Uh, I decided not to put anything on the posters. I have black poster frames with movie posters uh, in, inside them. Uh, and it would have been cool to actually use some Lego stickers to, to represent some posters, but I decided to go with the more uh, minimalist style here. But I still think it looks great. So now that the Beyblade, Bitbeasts, Dragoon, and Dronzer are mostly complete, I think it's time to start working on the third one, Drasil. Big purple turtle boy. And uh, that posed to be a little bit of a problem, or at least an intimidation, because... Anytime I attempt to build something in purple, it's always a question of whether the parts I want to use actually come in the color I want to use them in. Uh, so I started this model by basically collecting all of the purple elements that I have that I thought I wanted to use, and then I pulled up a list on BrickLink of all of the pieces that come in dark purple, and I cross-referenced all of that information to build a shape that actually comes in purple. Uh, it's a little bit easier these days. There's a lot more parts that come in purple now than there used to be, but it's always still a little daunting. Fortunately, most of Drasil is gray or black armor, just like his head and parts of his arms and legs are purple, uh, but it was still a little bit intimidating, like I said. Fortunately, what I have here, I'm actually quite satisfied with so far. You can see just his head and the beginnings of his shell armor. Here it is from the back. The shell itself right now is almost entirely hollow, and that's because of the way his neck attaches and how all of that works. You see, they make clips, the C-clips here, 
in purple, but they don't make the bar holder pieces in purple. So instead of having those to clip these two, I have to settle for these uh, locking hinge pieces or these soft ratchet elements and this connection is rather loose unless you double up on it so I have a double connection here that combined together is quite solid but what it means is that there's no articulation in this neck assembly itself on its own it's locked at about a 45 degree curve which is fine i think it looks nice um, but all of the articulation is facilitated by the way the neck actually connects to the shell itself and it actually provides this really natural amount of movement because it attaches on this sort of two stud connection which gives it like this double joint and allows for like i said this natural curve and the moment it meets resistance it kind of bends out of the way it's hard to explain but it's super tactile uh and and has this really nice hand feel to it so i'm very satisfied with the level of range it has but also just how solid it is the way it all connects i am quite satisfied with this model so far like i said i just hope that the rest of it lives up to the way i feel about it right now i decided to shelve this project for the moment however because i had a couple of bricklink orders coming in um, i had a few other ideas so once again, at the time of this recording, I have not continued this project. I'm sort of saving that for next week. Just when I thought I was done with the bedroom vignette, it pulled me back in. I realized that the clothes hamper detail was actually too big, and I understood that if I made it a little bit smaller, I could shift everything over on that wall to add more detail and make that side of the room more accurate. But before we take a look at that, I do want to mention that I changed the chair slightly so that the back isn't square. I actually found another one of these octagon pieces these stop sign shaped pieces so that uh, it could be the same on the top and the bottom which I just think looks a lot nicer I also built some tennis shoes here just using these grill pieces which I think works really well and then over on the far right is a keyblade I actually have a life-size keyblade mounted on the wall in my room and so uh, here is my version of that feel free to use this keyblade design for your Sora or Kingdom Hearts minifigures uh, it's not perfectly accurate, but I think it does a pretty good job at the size and scale. So here is this side of the room looking proper, looking as it should. Now that I've shifted everything over, I have enough room to put tennis shoes by the trash can, which is where I keep them. And then this poster on the wall next to the TV is actually a Kingdom Hearts poster, and I have my uh, life-size keyblade displayed on the wall next to it. Uh, now that I have a giant key on the wall, I also felt like I didn't want a key uh, hanging on the coat hanger anymore. Uh, so I got rid of that. Also, if I tipped the model over, that key would just fall right off. So that was a little bit annoying. Uh, but with that said and done, I think I can finally say that this model is complete. Famous last words. Who knows? I might tweak it later. But for right now, and for the time being, in this episode, uh, it is done. On this day, I also went to Bricks and Minifigs, and they happened to have something there that I have been looking for for the longest time. It is a very specific Kingdom's Peasant minifigure that has a very specific torso printing, and it's very expensive on Bricklink. And so I've been hesitant to buy it for over a year now, probably. But they had it there. I was not expecting it. It was a price I was willing to pay, so I went ahead and got it. 
Finally, I have all of the pieces collected that I need to put this guy together. This is Quoth from the King Killer Chronicle. The name of the wind, wise man's fear. He is the main character. It is one of my favorite fantasy book series. And like I said, I have been planning to put this together for so, so long. And it's really nice to finally have him. Full credit to Cadigan Photography on Flickr. I did a Google search for Quoth minifigure. This is one of the ones that came up. And I looked at the picture of his and I said, yep, that is almost exactly how I would do it myself. The torso, the face, the hair, the cloak, pretty much everything about it was spot on in my opinion. And so I added all the pieces of it to a BrickLink wanted list that's been around for the longest time as I planned to collect all of the parts and put them together so I can have one of my own. The loot here is actually a custom piece. That is not Lego, and that's something I usually frown upon. That's something I usually decide not to go for. I could have brick built his loot, but this instrument is very, very important to his character, and so I thought it was necessary for him to have an actual proper loot, whether it be Lego or not. If Lego ever actually makes their own loot, I will replace this, but for now, this is what I've got. Cadigan's minifigure actually also had a custom cloak that kind of went around the shoulders a little bit more, but I happened to have the official uh, dark green Lego cloak, and I didn't think it was all that necessary for him to have the larger one, uh, so I went with the official Lego one instead, and I think it looks just fine. This is actually quite an expensive minifigure. That cloak is pretty hard to find, too. So between that, the torso, his head, which comes from a single Star Wars set, it's probably going to run you a couple of bucks as well. This is like a $60 minifigure. I know it doesn't look like it, but it's very simple and very expensive. <laughs> but I was really determined to put it together, uh, and here it finally is. The face is actually dual-sided, and I think both of these expressions really, really work for the character. Here's a better look at his torso print. One of the reasons I really wanted to go with this is because it's a ratty shirt. Uh, Quoth, for the longest time in the books, is not very wealthy. He's got only a couple of shirts, uh, and, and so... They're not very expensive, but he tries to take care of them. But another very important part about this character is his coin purse. And this torso has, you know, a, a purse wrapped around his torso and, and at his hip. Uh, money is very important in these books. How much money Quoth has currently is very, very important in these books. So I thought that needed to be well represented. And again, on the minifigure that I found, it was. So pretty much everything about this minifigure is exactly how I would do it. Now I have him with a sword here. Uh, technically he doesn't get a sword, or at least he's not proficient with a sword until like far into the second book. And by then he technically should not be wearing these clothes. I think this is the most iconic look for Quoth with the more ratty shirt and the green cloak. Uh, but by the time he gets a sword, he should have like a black wispy cloak and, and much nicer clothes. I actually thought about making a completely separate minifigure that represents him from book two, and then this one would represent him from book one, but the cape that I want for that is also quite expensive. It's from a Lord of the Rings set, a single Lord of the Rings set, uh, so that'll maybe happen at a later date. But for now, I've got a Quoth up on my shelf, and I am very happy with that. And then, on the last day, I received a BrickLink order that had the rest of the parts I needed to finish up Dragoon. So he is now color-coordinated with the orange on his legs, the gray on his horns, and the blue all the way down his back 
and tail. And he's looking really, really nice. I love the way that this guy turned out. Here he is in a flying pose, just so you can see how long he is from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail. And finally, here he is in the iconic Dragoon S pose from the Beyblade bit chip. You can see I curled his tail down and back and used that to prop him up on a stand. That's actually a lid from one of the old X-Pod sets. I never thought I'd get mileage out of this, but here it is. It's a very specific piece that happens to have anti-studs that face upward so that he can plug into it very solidly and it keeps him balanced quite well. I chose the yellow one because the background of the bit chip on the Beyblade is yellow, so it's as if Dragoon is being summoned out of the Beyblade. But he looks great in this pose with his arms crossed. I specifically designed his arms to pull off this pose, and I'm glad that he looks really good assuming it. Unfortunately, I am still waiting on one more Bricklink order so that I can complete Dronzer. It's taking a lot longer than anticipated, and I'm kind of annoyed by that, so he might not be finished for another week or so at this point, unfortunately. But at the very least, I have Dragoon complete, and I am very, very happy with it. So I mentioned that I'm currently re-watching the original Beyblade anime, and I've finally made it to Season 2, where all of the Bit Beasts are now drawn and animated in fully colored detail. I've been taking like 20 screenshots an episode at this point, so I should have an absolute wealth of source material for Drasil and Drigger. And hopefully, that'll make things a lot easier. Anyway, as always, special thanks to all of my Patreon supporters, especially my generous leader class patrons, Valraven, Beyond the Brick, Beta, and Eric. Until next time, this has been Rollout, signing off.